there. Okay. You could do that. So. Welcome, uh, everyone. And I'd just like to acknowledge that uh, certainly in terms of the, the Zoom account um, and where I am, that I'm in uh, the land of the Wurundjeri people and uh, who are the traditional owners of uh, the Melbourne city where I'm currently hosted and I pay respect. Uh, and I welcome the artists for Make the World Again uh, here today. Uh, this is an exhibition that was originally planned for Crafted Vancouver, which was going to be happening now uh, in Canada. And Australia was the guest country as part of Canada's year of craft. So it was a very auspicious moment. And uh, we're very excited about all the workshops and everything that would come off that. But of course, it was one of the many things that has been cancelled. And we do hope that there is potential for this to be realised next year uh, in Crafted Vancouver 2021. Uh, but now what we've tried to do is to uh, take advantage of the possibilities of doing it uh, on, an, on the website and with the artists present on the same screen and also to widen the exhibition to include practices that aren't necessarily strictly related to weaving, but also around textiles. So the the overall concept was about the degree to which uh, the world can be conceived as bound in some way and has having been created through textile processes and that this is one of the ways in which we understand how the world came into being. But it had a particularly Australian story in the Canadian context because of the uh, shared issues that we have with Canada, one obviously being as, as uh, settler colonies, uh, relationship between the, the settler and the indigenous uh, cultures, which comes through so much uh, in the work, but also the mix of migrant cultures and uh, the way in which uh, countries like Australia and Canada fare, share similar challenges in terms of how we put those cultures together. And the, the process of weaving, embroidery, other kinds of uh, textile processes offer us with a a material process by which that can be visualized and we can come up with products that we can share that offer testimony to that. So that was the kind of original thinking in terms of uh, drawing on the talents of artists within Australia to present to the Canadians. But since then, of course, uh, we've come across a world that suddenly stopped and perhaps in some ways has been falling apart with deglobalization. And one of the challenges that we face is how to put it back together again. And some are, of course, are wanting the same world put back together again that we had before, because it was going along so well. And others think, well, maybe this is a chance to you know, rethink how the world comes together. So Make the World Again, of course, has echoes with um, certain slogans in US politics but uh, to give it a positive spin and to think about it as something more productive rather than simply uh, trying to restore what was uh, the privileged position of certain cultures in the world. So the plan uh, now is to, to go through the exhibition by looking at the work by the different artists and I will put them on the screen and then invite uh, that artist to speak just briefly about the work uh, for one or two minutes and uh, see if anyone else has something particular they want to ask of uh, the artist at the time. So if we go to the website now, I'll get this uh, on screen. Uh, and uh, just a sec, I'll have to... Here we are with the uh, website. 
and uh, I'll just uh, maximize that. And uh, if we could start with uh, Abdullah Sayyid in uh, Karachi, in Pakistan now, whose work deconstructs the very basis of the, the modern society in terms of the monetary system and, and uh, restitches it into rug-like forms that have a very important cultural heritage. Uh, so Abdullah, welcome and uh, uh, we look forward to hearing you know, your thoughts about uh, what generated this particular work. Thank you, Kevin. Good day and assalamu alaikum to our audience. Um, uh, just a small disclaimer. Um, I'm, particularly, I'm not a textile artist, but what I do is that I've learned textile and I've been using textile in my art practice, or should I say fiber art, as an expanded field of inquiry. And that's uh, to do that, I've been collaborating and inviting other craftsmen to work with me. So this particular body of work um, that is part of this exhibition was created um, with, uh, with an assistant of Adelaide-based weaver, Janet Mohan. I was very fortunate that I was in Adelaide for a residency and I met her. And during that time, I found uh, a bag of uh, shredded decommissioned US dollar bills at an auction house. And they were small strands, and I was thinking about using them, converting them, bringing back into the to the art world um, uh, this money that we talk about in art so much, or or, or um, something that we use. And I want to repurpose them, um, but I couldn't figure out how to do it. And I was I was talking to these wonderful weavers, and we start talking about it. And I mentioned that I've been using rugs uh, in my work. I've been producing rugs in different ways, sculptural ways, drawing and printmaking. And um, what drawn to me the rugs and as well as banknotes, uh, they both are heterotopic. Uh, they show us, they present images and places that are sometimes unknown to us, very fantastical, uh, very heavenly like. So I thought that what if, if I will combine them together and then create this, um, uh, these objects that I actually call them fabricating economies. And then we start exploring it. So the very uh, the middle small piece that you see in isometric view, what my, what, uh, that was my first trial piece that I made with them. And it is a very small piece and it was done on a frame uh, uh, loom. And it was, it was quite a tedious process that the thread that I use is actually a Pakistani thread, which is, uh, which is called Zardozi thread and is used uh, in uh, decorative uh, fabrics, uh, especially bridal gowns and things like that. Um, so after producing that small piece, um, I start collaborating with Janet specifically and I produced 12 uh, woven pieces out of those 12, I'm exhibiting three of them in this exhibition and the rest of them recently exhibited in Pakistan. Great, thank you very much, Abdullah, for that. Thank and uh, uh, I'm inviting anybody who has any questions to ask Abdullah or comments. So, uh, Sorry, Kevin. I just wanted to say it's a, um, it's a beautiful and thought-provoking work. Thanks for sharing it. Thank you. I, I could also add that it's interesting. It was made in Adelaide, uh, where Fiona Hall's work hails from using banknotes as well. So, a lovely parallel. Thank you. There. I didn't know that. Thank mm. you for mentioning that. I did not know that. I'm, I'm a huge fan of Fiona Hall's work. So, yeah. Uh, especially woven uh, nest, nest pieces that she did. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Abdullah. And Thank uh, you. if we go to Cressid now, uh, if you'd like to speak uh, to your work. Please. Yes. Um, the piece that you've chosen, Kevin, um, is from an exhibition that I had, oh, that's not my way. <laughs> I know, it's coming up, we'll get there. Um, uh, an exhibition that I had in Sri Lanka 
it, which started in uh, February last year. And um, I made 13 w works for this exhibition. And uh, basically it's, it's a revisitation because I was born there and I lived there till I was 11 years old. So I had all my primary school education in Colombo. And then we emigrated to Australia. And uh, for me, uh, I started actually going back to Sri Lanka seriously in 2009, just after the civil, the year that the Civil War finished. And um, over the years, um, I did a lot of drawing and um, photographing of landscapes. And uh, I suppose the work in a way is a, is a homage to the landscape of my country, which I've, you know, as I say, I've been lucky enough to explore since 2009. Um, I feel that, um, you know, my work, it's not, it's not really, it doesn't, it's not political, it doesn't have a particular ph uh, philosophy and I feel that um, it's almost accidental that um, it is uh, w in woven form. Um, in 1976, when I was training to be a weaver at the tapestry workshop, I really discovered my medium that I really absolutely loved and wanted to work in for the rest of my life. So now I've been a weaver for 44 years. But I think that if I wasn't weaving, I would be painting or drawing. So um, the work has a degree of representation. And these particular works um, of Yala, which is, uh, it's a, um, an area in the, in the south of um, Sri Lanka, which is uh, a wildlife park. Um, I think, you know, I tried to sort of um, get the atmosphere of, of the place as we came upon um, this absolutely sublime area, which was a wetland full of water lilies and, and the stumps of trees, as you can see, growing out of it. And for me, it's just a, a sort of a recognition of that particular landscape. And were you weaving it in plein air? Were you no, sitting these there? Are not, these are not on plein air mm -hmm. pieces. What, what actually brought me to landscape was um, weaving in the open air with, with a tiny frame. Um, when I did a residency at Bundanon in 2003, I started doing that and that actually brought me to landscape as subject matter. And since then, um, my work has, has all been about landscapes, yeah. Right. Well, certainly it's a, an important process for, for being in the place. Yes, in immersed, the way you're doing it, immersed as we've in seen the some of the other works. Yeah. So this and, particular work, it's, it's a combination of, of, um, of uh, photographs and a painted, and, and paint mm -hmm. uh, in collage, yeah. Mm. Right. Oh. Does anyone have anything to ask Chrissy? Good, thank you very much, uh, Chrissy. And uh, now if we could go to Eloise. Uh, welcome. And we Hello. have your work originating from uh, Hong Kong. Yes, yes, it is. Um, well, I'd just like to preface this by saying I'm not uh, what I would call a practicing textile artist, but when I do sort of seek to undertake textile art projects, it's usually something that is inspired by community. Um, so the Weaving Pang Chai project is, um, is a collaborative weaving project that I did with members of the Pang Chai, which is a, um, a fabric hawker market in Hong Kong. When, um, so when I first visited Hong Kong, maybe about four years ago, um, is the first time I visited this, this special place, the Pang Jai, which 
um, is Cantonese. In Cantonese, it means um, little little shacks or little sheds, which is sort of what this incredible old uh, ramshackle um, fabric market looks like. Um, what I was most, what I found most inspiring about this this place and and the people is something I can probably say for Hong Kongers on a, on the whole is I'm really inspired by the tenacity and resilience. So this is a place where people working literally on the street level in Hong Kong are constantly facing this struggle of a very dominating um, capitalist sort of big business oriented government that. Um, uh, doesn't make life very easy for them. And the, the hawker markets in Hong Kong, which is the livelihood of so many people on the low income spectrum, um, they have been, the city has been actively removing them since the 50s and 60s. And this is the last remaining fabric hawker market in the city. And um, a friend took me there and I, I met um, a lot of the vendors, which ha they had some very interesting sort of stories to share about um, uh, how business has been for them over the years, what has changed in the city. And um, I, it really struck a nerve with me and I wanted to sort of create a textile response that embodied, as, as I think I said in the, on the website, the sort of unique character of the, the Peng Jai and its, um, its importance as, uh, as a Hong Kong sort of living heritage because um, I, I don't think that the Peng Jai is going to be around for too much longer. So um, I used uh, just a sort of um, a, a kind of rag weaving process for this. So each of the vendors um, gave me a, a small scrap of weavable fabric, which I shredded into yarn and um, and sort of wove wove together in a in a random kind of design, which sort of expresses the very um, kind of densely packed random multicolored interior of the, the the winding narrow kind of corridors of this fabric market and um, and on the surface of the uh, the weaving I embroidered the um, all of the sellers surnames just um, just in a very you know simple cotton thread just to um, kind of emphasize the fact that uh, there are there are people attached to um, this this kind of uh, this fabric industry in Hong Kong and it's those sort of livelihoods that um, that uh, sort of under threat with the um, kind of closure of these markets um, so it was, a, it was a lovely process of working with community and um, I hope to be able to visit Peng Jai very soon Thanks very much, uh, Eloise. Have you shown this work in Hong Kong and has there been a, an interest in it? Um, I have. I, I showed it at a small um, exhibition that was actually part of uh, Saori, Weaving Saori Workshop in, in Hong Kong um, through the Centre for Community Development through a small uh, exhibition of a lot of uh, Saori works and other woven works by, um, by the community. And they really kindly invited me because um, it was, uh, it's down the road from the, the Peng Chai in a neighborhood, a very poor and working class neighborhood called Sham Shui Po in, mm. in Hong Kong, Kowloon side. So um, uh, yeah, that's, that's where it's been so far. It was really special to have it, well, to have hopefully, it up. Hopefully it'll get to Canada. Any, any, <laughs> I, hope, I hope everyone's does. <laughs> yes. Any questions for Eloise? Beautiful work, Eloise. Beautiful. Oh, thanks, Abdullah. It's, uh, really, it's really wonderful to see that, that uh, you're taking the textile as a collaborative effort and bringing the community together. You know, that's something very common in my practice, too, because I also learned... Um, uh, textile from my mother. So I've collaborated with my family and now collaborating with the community and I think textile does that. That's very kind of you. Thank you. I agree. Well, certainly following that theme, I think it's it's a strong part of uh, the work by Eva Obinga. And uh, Eva, I invite you to uh, talk about uh, your work now. Thank you. Um, uh, my pro project, Arrival of the Raja, um, actually, I guess, a second part of something that um, happened earlier, which was a performance and um, some some flags that I made for um, the Ukrainian community to settle to commemorate the 80-year 
um, Holland de Mord. Um, so the, the Holland de Mord being the murder of Ukrainians under Stalin. So I made a work, I was asked by the community to make a work for a, a, um, a walk that um, went through the city of Melbourne and ended at Fed Square, which is, you know, a big yeah, centre of the city. Um, and my background is actually in painting and I kind of came to the, the realisation that doing a painting in Fed Square was not going to work. So I made these large flags, which I got the community to carry um, and dyed them um, in a dark colour. So I had these flags and I did this performance and I guess I was left with this real sense of um, to explore the parallels between um, the Holodomor and the genocide of um, Ukrainian people to the Australian experience and to my own feelings being um, a coloniser of Australia. So... Um, I started to explore, and I, I, at that time I read um, Rosalika Parker's um, text about um, um, embroidery and became quite obsessed with um, embroidery and kind of reconnecting with my Ukrainian embroidery teach. Um, and I had access to a community of embroiderers prepared and eager to help make some embroideries. And then I also was thinking about how to join these flags together and I came across quilting. And then I reached out to the quilting community in Geelong, um, the Patchwork and Quilters Guild, and started going to their meetings and learning the art of quilting, which I knew nothing about at the time. Um, and from that, um, I started to join these embraces into the quilts and I made these kits which people took home and quilted together. And some of the quilters were first time quilters who had never quilted before. And then other people were advanced. Some of them were master quilters like um, Susan Matthews who did some really a lot of uh, um, quilting, art quilting for me. So um, what eventuated was uh, this sculpture that um, essentially brought together all of the the flag, um, flags and the poles. And um, then I did a series of performances with that. Um, yeah, I guess was um, carried out over a series. Of months. And yeah, I think, um, I think there was a, at least 60 people involved in the work together and then probably another 60 people involved with doing the different performances of places. Right. Yeah, it's, uh, I think for me, it's that bringing together of community has been a really enriching part of my practice and one that's um, quite missed at the moment, um, working independently. Yes, well, it's certainly a, 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 an epic project, perhaps as epic as the original Raja quilt that, that came on the convict ship to Tasmania. And... Uh, brings together so many of the important themes around us. And I think like a lot of the artists in this exhibition, there's more than just one object. It's, it's all that went into it and the people involved and, and so on. So thank you very much for that, Eva. Does anybody have any comment or question? It's a really powerful, beautiful work. Yeah, thanks. thanks thank you. Good. Now let's uh, go to Ilka, and uh, glad to expand the exhibition to include your incredible piece. Hello, Ilka. Hello, thank you. Uh, the work I think you're going to put up is um, oh. it's called Singularity, and it's it's a piece that grew um, from a, a letter I received from a friend who was um, doing a, a retreat, a Buddhist retreat in the forest and he sketched this drawing um, just in biro I think on the back of an envelope um, in while he was in a teaching about connectivity or, or interconnectedness and how everything is interconnected and so this piece um, was embroidered it's an embroidery of his drawing over the top of an image of the sky 
on dusk or just into the darkness through trees up towards the light, the, the fading light. And it's a piece that um, for me reminds me of that very central truth that everything is connected and that we rely, rely on the natural world and one another um, in such powerful and important ways. And, and that if anything happens to any part, all parts are affected. Um, and it, it came as a part of a, a body of work at that time. It was made called Dwelling, um, where I was really endeavouring to, well, not endeavouring, but enjoying and celebrating dwelling deeply in place, lo very local place, which at the time I was living on the Merry Creek in Northcote, in, in the northern suburbs of Melbourne. And so this was um, part of that body of work, really celebrating place and acknowledging our re reliance on place. And um, having moved to Castlemaine now, I think that same is with me as well. And I just want to acknowledge Jajurung, um, Jara community here on Jajurung country for continuing the work of looking after I now live on. The piece below it is called Well, and it's another acknowledgement of that interconnected um, truth that um, that came from a dream I had during a particularly difficult time um, where I dreamt of, of an un like an underground well beneath my feet which held all the sustenance that I was feeling I was lacking and it was all there beneath my feet really very close and it was just a change of awareness I guess the dream I felt the dream was telling me um, that we have what we need beneath our feet. We needn't go searching far and wide for it. And um, so it's a, again about connection to country and it's made, you, it, as I woke that dream of that, that well, morphed into something very delicate and fragile and, um, and yet still very strongly rooted. So it's this vessel uh, and I think that my thinking about Kevin's provocation with this um, show about um, the history of textiles and the vessel is a very big part for me of that, the early basketry, um, the need to gather in, in gathering to have a, something to bring things home in to sustain us. So it's about sustenance, it, sort of symbolically in this case, but the vessel and the rootedness are both elements that are there that speak to those themes. It sounds quite an exacting method. Uh you're using in putting together these, the grass, treating the grass and the wild oats. Yeah, this, quite delicate. this piece is made of hollow dry grass, a grass commonly known as wild oats, which is a weed, uh, or at least, you know, defined as a weed. It's a non-Indigenous grass that grows along the Merry Creek and many other parts of Australia. Um, and I guess I'm, I identify a little bit with being, you know, a non-Indigenous person living on unceded lands and so these this grass is hollow and dry in the summer and I used the grass broken into short lengths like a bugle bead and threaded those um, onto beading line which is very fine strong but very fine and actually almost worked against me because it's so um, fine and strong that it can slice through the grass if I pull too tightly on on it while I'm making it the grass uh, is so it's certainly a, a balancing act. Mm. As, Any, as I guess we, our lives are living yes, on a indeed. finite planet. Um, mm -hmm. Any comments for Ilka? I just want to say how beautiful the work is and um, I find the first piece particularly moving and particularly relevant in the time that we're living in now, the inconnected interconnectedness that we all need to survive, you know, beautiful. Certainly seems a singular moment. Uh, thanks, Ilka. Now, Julia, hello. Hello. Um, the work that you're going to show, Kevin, um, I produced during a period when I'd only just recently moved to Melbourne from Sydney. 
Um, I had been um, working in India and I decided not to go back to Sydney and to move to Melbourne. And I found, um, oh, you know, the, the notion of relocation to be, you know, quite um, disrupting. And I didn't know very many people in Melbourne. But I was really lucky to find a studio space and I started working originally with the idea of uh, creating a body of work that was based on photographs and images and references that I'd gathered while I was in India. <clears throat> but while I was in the studio, I, I was listening to the radio the whole time and it was during the period of the refugees arriving in Australia by boat and the work started to change really dramatically so I I shifted from it, it shifted from this joyous um, colorful um, pattern-based uh, work that was all about a celebration of a culture that I'd had a, a, a fantastic time being able to explore to feeling really challenged about um, what was happening with the refugees that were arriving uh, in Australia. And I uh, still, whilst I was still using some of the images that I'd um, gathered, and primarily most of those were from um, Islamic architecture um, sites that I'd visited while I was in Rajasthan, <clears throat> I started to um, think more about what I was hearing on the news. The fabrics were, were printed and resist dyed, so they're made up of lots of layers and essentially it was about uh, two sides to every story. We were being told one story, but people were arriving and they had other stories and we weren't actually getting to hear the stories of the people who were arriving. Um, yeah, so essentially that's what the work is about. I find, you know, it took me a year to make the work or actually nearly two years to make a body of work for two exhibitions. One that was here in Canberra and one was at, the, at Craft Victoria. And I just wanted to create an environment that people could walk around and see through the translucent fabrics that there were two different things happening on each side um, and try to get a sense of, you know, what it was like for the people who were arriving to be dislocated. Well, that's unfortunately one of the limits of a screen, obviously, Julia, and not being <laughs> able to show that duality, which we'll hopefully get to experience when the exhibition comes together, possibly for the Australian Tapestry Workshop later this year. Um, but it's a beautifully printed fabric and uh, the, way it, the way it inhabits, it breathes in silk is uh, something quite special. Thank you, Kevin. Any other comments before we go on? Uh, thank you, Julia. Lee, uh, we go to uh, Gippsland now. Uh, Lee Dirk, uh, welcome. Thank you. Um, so I did some, I made 38 baskets um, when I was at a residency this year and the end of last year at the Australian Print um, Tapestry Workshop in um, South Melbourne and what I did was I wove them using the traditional um, Victorian basket weaving stitch that the great Gunnar Kurnai elders, Annie Eady and, um, and others, Annie Linda taught me that I, I intermarried them, these ones, these particular group of four I call intermarriage within the exhibition because I intermarried the work with um, the ends of the bobbins, so the ends of the silk or the cotton or um, the wool that was being used in this um, tapestry workshop at that time, just the end of the work. And I put the two together and the whole exhibition is an installation called of 38 language groups of Victoria. And what I was looking at was um, the, the notion, which is going to be the theme for NAIDOC week this year, of we always was, always will be Aboriginal land, which as Aboriginal people we've grown up with that um, saying, you know. And so, like, I suppose what I was doing too was looking at strengthening the ties between us as language groups as we go into what will hopefully be the final negotiations around treaty, um, which have been going on for a while. And I want 
hopefully in the next two years we'll see some sort of accumulation of that and there will be a treaty on Makarata written up. Anyway, that's what I was looking at, yeah, with these works. Um, and so some of them are, are baskets. Three of them are at the Australian Tapestry Workshop right now in a show called Air 19. And then these are some of the remaining ones. And then behind me, I don't know if you can see, but in my office, I've got a ton of baskets and feathers floating around, which is not perhaps traditionally textile, but I often weave um, feathers into the basketry. Yeah, that's about it. Really. Thanks very much, Lee. Uh, it's yeah. wonderful to have <clears throat> such a complex story given three-dimensional form like that. The particular technique of weaving these baskets, uh, where does that come from? So the stitch is coiled basketry, so it, it's a, the oldest form of weaving. That, that um, well, That's what we were told as we grew up. And so that you begin in the, in the middle and then it coils out like a giant snail. Um, it's a style of weaving called basketry that's used across southeastern Australia. Um, and some of my ancestors from Maloga Mission many years ago up on the Murray River, they were taken by the missionary's wife. Um, Janet um, Matthews took them to Bathurst Island where uh, they taught a number of Aboriginal women from up there the coil basketry stitch, which today they still acknowledge today that um, we've got that connection. So we've done a series of um, exhibitions over the years called Twine Together. Uh, the last one I was involved in was in um, Melbourne Museum and we had people come down from up north and they showed us, they shared with us their um, way of making dyes using vegetable um, plants. Yeah, when that was fantastic. And I've since gone up to um, Yongu people, some of the, some of the women um, who were involved in the exhibitions in Melbourne um, have been to um, Gellowinku up there on Elko Island. Yeah. Well, that's... hopefully you'll get a chance to, uh, I know they were very excited about your workshops this year in Vancouver, Lee, so hopefully you'll get a chance next year because uh, that well, sort of in dialogue is, Vancouver. Indigenous dialogue has been so important between Australia and, and Canada. Yeah, yeah, we've got a lot in common. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, Kevin. Thanks, Lee. Any comments before we go on? Such a beautiful way to visualise such a, um, a rich network of languages, Lee. It's lovely. Yeah, stitched together. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Thanks, Eloise. Liz, if we can go to, to you and your exhibition uh, within an exhibition. I'll get that up. Uh, thanks, Kevin. And um, so uh, I'm a weaver and last year I was thinking towards this year wanting a weaving project. I was about to go to India. Uh, previously, I've done a lot of um, research into uh, um, dyeing here, plant dyeing in particular, and particularly at the beginning of settlement in Sydney, when because um, Australia was settled 70 odd years before Perkins discovered mauve, so before chemical dyes were available. So I've, I've looked into that quite a bit. Um, so, and also I curate a couple of years ago I, in 2008, I, 18, I curated an exhibition called Local Colour for UNSW Galleries, which showcased uh, Australian artists who had been working with plant dyes for a, a, a long period of time, uh, which I thought was important because at the moment there's a huge number of people using plant dyes and botanical dyes or natural dyes, whatever you like to call them. But uh, there is a lot of people here who have um, a very long practice involved in natural dyeing. So I dreamt up this project and it coincided with Kevin's invitation. So it all worked, um, it, it fell into place quite nicely. And it was uh, to include people from Australia and also India uh, dyeing um, some silk fabric in local eucalyptus dyes. Uh, and then I've, once I've got the fabric, which was not until I got back from India in late February this year, I ripped it up and I've woven these strips. So the strips are uh, 16 to 18 centimetres wide and most are about a metre long. Um, 
So it's to include, it's this community of practice and practitioners. This is half of what I've got, as I mentioned before. And they're all ra quite random, like uh, in the ripping up of the fabric, they become, um, uh, it changes the way the fabric looks and clearly in the weaving, it becomes striped. A lot of them become striped. It is uh, carrying on from a previous work that I did with my local plants, which is a tree outside my house and um, uh, eucalyptus pularis and eucalyptus cinerea, which is the silver dollar leaf, which I get from the florist, which I view as local, local source, probably strictly not kosher, but anyway. Uh, and I've done this, uh, a project like this, and the main thing that it came out of it was this striped effect that I got in the weaving and how that really referenced so many other forms of um, dyeing and weaving, Ikat in particular, uh, and just became a predominant thing that I was interested in, the stripes that are, appear. Mary Burgess, who's in the exhibition and not here, hers is this very striped one, which is, uh, well, it's the fourth from my right. So. And hers was, um, I've got all the details. I've sent most of them to Kevin. I'm hoping they get up at some stage, but um, anyway, um, just on this, uh, I've done quite a lot of research into eucalyptus in India. It's fascinating. People think it's a uh, native of India. It's not because eucalyptus were only here in Australia and Papua New Guinea until the British came. Tipu Sultan, who is in Mysore in India, uh, planted eucalyptus in his, le in his garden in the late 1780s. So he very quickly got seeds from Australia. And I don't quite know how he got them, but there's, um, he may have got them from um, Banks who came, came here very early. So there, it's been fascinating. This has given me a great um, reason to do some research into eucalyptus in, Austra in India and also Australia. A lot of the artists that I approached in India to die with eucalyptus, they said, oh, no, no, we don't do that. You use the local eucalyptus. But uh, so I then collected leaves and have dyed some of that fabric myself. But I'm waiting on two um, pieces from India, which have been affected. The quarry of getting them here has been affected by the lockdown. Uh, but everybody in Australia seemed to respond positively to this request and Holly Story's workers here and um, Julie Ryder's, Ilka, Ilka White's, Ro Cook's, Mary's, several of them I've died. So, and in the next slot, um, Ilka and Blake Griffiths and um, other friends from here, Chris Hutch, a number of people involved. So it's been an interesting project to liaise with people and um, with community of practice. And really it references the rag rug tradition, which um, Eloise has also mentioned, uh, because that was, that was uh, rugs and things made out of readily available materials. Mm -hmm. These are not necessarily readily available, but certainly the dyes are readily available. Thanks very much, Liz. And it's interesting how your work's becoming a lot, seems to be more collaborative. Uh, thinking about the piece that you had last year of upholstery with uh, John Goulda. That, um, yeah, that um, was a true collaboration. I've been wondering whether I should be saying this is a collaboration, but basic, well, you know, it is in a way because everybody has contributed, people have contributed to the colouring of the fabric mm. and they've coloured it in different ways. Yeah, and you've interpreted that. Yes, this it's is really a great wonderful. Working, Kevin. It's very yes. good. thanks for giving me the opportunity for this project. Good, good timing. Any comments for Liz? I love the way you've traced the journey of the eucalyptus as well, Liz. Where will it end up next? <laughs> well, it will need, end up somewhere with uh, Siri Hayes, as we, ah, we'll yeah. see. Um, I like Siri. Very... Anybody else? I'm interested in other people being involved. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, unfortunately, because of um, illness, uh, Mary Burgess isn't able to be with us, but uh, what her works add is a very kind of personal dimension in terms of her practice as a kind of textile therapy in dealing particularly with uh, mourning and the way in which often when somebody's passed that we have their, their clothes and various other parts uh, that 
live on after them and to, as a textile artist, to find forms that can help us coexist with those pieces, uh, I think is a, a really interesting dimension of reconstructing the world, not just culturally, but also personally through textiles. And, uh, but now let's move on. Can, can I just mention of Mary's work? Yes. It, it just um, is another example of the power that textiles have as really um, strong emotional ties to um, people and situations and memories. I think, I think your wider theme about the, the origins of textiles and their power still is still um, true. And Mary's work is an example of just how powerful they can be for us. Particularly, you know, given our development as it's one of our first sensory experiences, obviously, is around textiles. So that it leaves a great imprint in our psychologies. Uh, now, Sarah, should with um, Munau, Munau Poe's work, would you like to speak to that? Yes, that as long be... as she's happy for me to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure who's with her. Hello, Munau. Um, would you like me to speak or is there someone there who can translate? Add to teacher. We teach it, okay. Okay, so okay. I'm very happy to speak. Um, uh, this is Sarah speaking, and um, I've worked with Munor and Shukle uh, for um, about seven years now. And they first started off um, doing a workshop at the Tapestry Workshop when I was still working there. And I taught a group of about um, 12, I think. And at the end of that, Munor and um, Shukle, and also um, Munor's 90-year-old mother has become involved in the, in the sort of ongoing Karen Weaver's uh, project. But in this show, we've just got Munor and Shukle. And um, they've had uh, many exhibitions now. And um, Munor particularly seems to manage a large scale really well, physically she manages it. Um, Shukle doesn't manage a larger scale so well anymore. Um, but the main thing really, I guess, is that they come from a very strong weaving tradition, uh, which has um, a significant amount of pattern. Um, so that's yeah, a lovely photo there. And um, they just took to weaving really, easily and anyone and perhaps probably all of you who teach you recognize that very quickly in people and their just um ease and joy of manipulating the fiber on the loom and they both um responded really strongly to uh, eccentric weft and the notion of um laying in thread and the the looseness and the freedom that they could get from that so even though they have this history of wonderful pattern making, in their tapestries, I argue very strongly that they're absolutely contemporary works that aren't reworking any traditional patterns, but the idea that they're sort of embodied in them and then being transmitted um, in a new contemporary way is, is significant. So when I ask um, Muno uh, what, what she's thinking about or what her tapestries are about, she, she usually just laughs <laughs> and, and says um, colour, colour and pattern. And this one is called In My Mind's Eye. And we spent about one day about, oh, I don't know, at least an hour talking about this work with the help of uh, one of the uh, um, Shukle's daughter, who um, that mm, generation now, of course, speak perfect English. And um, she talked a lot about um, just her imagination. That's really what came across most, most clearly. So I said, well, in, in, Australia, in English, we have this phrase in, in my mind's eye. 
and um, with the sort of backwards and forwards and translation into Karen, um, Muno seemed to be very happy with that um, that as a, as a title. So I think um, certainly other works possibly have a closer, a more specific relationship to landscape. Both Shukle and Muno um, were born and grew up in, in the countryside in what was then Burma. And then um, they, they, I don't know how many of you know, but the Karen are an ethnic minority group that were chased out of Burma by the Burmese army. And they lived in, um, in Thai refugee camps for 20 years before they then came to um, Australia. So I think a lot of the designs are influenced by the, by the landscape. Certainly, um, um, Shuk Lei talks very clearly about um, the, the plant forms and, and landscape um, influencing. But the, the really important thing I think to acknowledge is that there's no preliminary artwork that's ever prepared for these works. Um, uh, both Munor and, and, and Chukle say to me, Munor is understanding more and more, which is fantastic. And it was so wonderful to hear her actually articulate um, some English today, but uh, she's illiterate and uh, her, her language is improving, but it's not fantastic. And I always have to have an interpreter. And Munor's language is, is considerably better. But they, um, they talk very much about, um, you know, thinking, thinking. We have these, this, these phrases, these lovely repetitive phrases, thinking, thinking, slowly, slowly. And I never know what I'm going to find on the loom. Um, so thinking, thinking, slowly, slowly, the designs um, just evolve on, on the loom, which is to me as such a sort of, you know, art school. <laughs> Um, graduate, uh, I would love to be able to produce works like this, mm. um, but I'm much more. Well, thank you for it. articulating it so well, Sarah. Yes. And uh, it certainly represents a obviously a very fluid kind of process, and it's just yeah. so alive. These mm. pieces, uh, yeah. they really are quite amazing. Any um, comments for Muno? Beautiful colours. I love the colour. The colour. Beautiful it. Muno. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I have to say, I love one of these artworks. I look at it every day and I just absolutely love it. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Um, now Beautiful. to you, Sarah, to talk about your work, um, which uh, was originally uh, related to a flag project that was in um, an exhibition in New York, I think. But uh, Oh, well. Now we've oh, moved, oh, okay. moved back so, to a key work of yours, which is the Allegiance series. That's that's right. So are you going to put that up? Or... Oh, yeah, okay. So, um, yes, yeah, so this is an old, old work from the 1990s and was only ever shown in, um, in an exhibition at the Fine Art Gallery in Hobart, where I lived for 10 years and um, throughout the 90s. And I started making work when I lived down there, which very much referenced the sort of my, the migrant condition, which um, has uh, a relationship with the uh, idea of migration has changed significantly since then, of course. Um, but I'm an English migrant and um, part of the sort of 10 pound POM, although I was, I was free because I was 15 and I, came to Australia and I think what's actually wonderful for this exhibition is that, uh, you know, I could just have easily have gone to Canada in the 60s when we came to Australia. We were, you know, families were either going to Australia or to Canada, um, but my father had someone here who sponsored, sponsored us. Um, so I made this work and I, I used um, gingham fabric for probably over 15 years and I, I, um, I, I love the fact that gingham is really an elemental fabric. So uh, for any weaver and most weaving cultures um, have some kind of gingham like check, check fabric in their sort of repertoire of, of weaves. So I very much use it as a metaphor for um, 
uh, the world, I guess, and um, for people all over the world. And when I was talking about um, the sort of migrant condition, um, I spoke a lot about du uh, sort of duality, dualisms. Um, a lot of the titles of the work were dualisms or what am I thinking of? Re rear vision, or roundness of return, patterns of survival. Um, and this particular work came out of, um, I went to uh, Italy and did a residency in um, a small town called Bozzozzo, which is near, near Milan. And um, I was really struck by the regionalism in, in Italy and um, this sort of idea of making my own sort of personal flags from this fabric that I was now becoming very well known for. Um, evolved and I think a lot of that links to the fact that you know still people say do you feel Australian or do you feel English and I actually I, I sometimes put a question mark after this title allegiance question mark because I think this is um, you know a huge issue now as national, nationalism sort of starting to be quite rampant around the world so it seemed like this um, this small flag project um, to sort of bury it in my studio uh, seemed a great opportunity to, to bring it out and, and make it current and um, although I stopped weaving with gingham for a, a long time um, I've really started uh, working with it again and I've been working with it in Portugal and I'm working with it again in um, my walk, COVID walking project. Mm. Well thank you very much uh... Sarah, uh, your work is always quite strong in terms of its modernist focus, particularly with the mm. line. The stripe, I know, has been a, an interest of yours, and perhaps the line of the skirt, your skirt project, is yes. also yeah. of that, which gives it a, a particular focus. And then to add to that, some of the cultural issues that you mentioned helps us see things quite afresh. And I think it's uh, great to be able to look back to a work like this and to think about it in the context of other work you've done previously that we reference on yeah. the website as well. Any other comments for Sarah? You're doing a lot of work tonight, Sarah. <laughs> do, um, do you want me to mention the flag? The, the uh, other project, or we might move on to... because just yep. in terms yep. of time, but the, 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 link, the link is there yeah, um, it's for there. people. Yep. It's certainly yep. an interesting one. Uh, Thank now, Thank Sarah you. Waters, um, hello. Hello, and I'm talking tonight from um, Adelaide, which is Ghana land. Um, so my project is a recent one, actually, um, Survivalist Sampler. And this, for me, is what I see the, the first in an ongoing series. And it's, I guess, my way of grappling with... Um, a lot of grief that's happening um, around great change that's happening or sometimes a lack of change when we talk about climate change um, in Australia and, and globally at the moment. Um, and it's a way for me personally to grapple and try to come to terms with um, the daily changes that are happening through news. I often sit down at um, the end of a long day and stitch something that I've learned from that day, some form of knowledge to carry forward into the future. Kind of struck me looking at the history of samplers that they, um, while they've been problematic, they've been used to kind of often educate girls or um, women into a kind of um, obedience or a, a moral kind of way of thinking. Um, they've also been very powerful in that they have um, educated people and they've, in their you know, original form, uh, carried along patterns and um, stitches and techniques um, for generations. So I use these samplers, and this one being the first one, as a repository of a whole lot of uh, knowledge. I've got in there uh, this idea that this might be a way of recording things if networks ever go down or you know things get really dire. I've got in there, you can see down the bottom um, next to the kettle, ways of purifying water so you can make your own like instructions how to make a water purifier or instructions how to do certain knots. Um, also 
many techniques, embroidery techniques like black work or cross stitch um, and other forms just to remember and pass them along. And I hope like other samplers that, you know, still exist today from, you know, long after their makers have passed away hundreds of years, this might live on way beyond um, my lifetime as well as a record of now. So it's very much and very consciously recording uh, those key ideas. Um, obviously this one was before coronavirus. I'm currently working on one that has a lot, um, uh, a lot more information about making masks or those daily um, rituals of tea drinking that are getting me through the day at the moment. I've also, um, because this was made with the intention of continuing and turning it into a collaborative uh, kind of venture. I've, uh, because I can't be in person with people, I started an online Instagram, like hashtag uh, survivalist sampler movement and lots of artists or stitchers, uh, hobbyists, people from all different backgrounds have started stitching their own survivalist samplers to record their daily experiences and their observations and their knowledge that they think is important to carry forward for future generations as well. Great, thank you very much, Sarah. And I guess when, as we're seeing now, lockdowns being lifted, it's gonna be so important to retain a glimpse of some of the alternatives that we imagined during this time. And this is kind of like a, a precious time capsule that uh, hopefully we can uh, keep in mind when all things return. Any other comments for Sarah? I just comment, Sarah, I looked at this today and I thought it was very refreshing to see the sampler form again and just to think about all the things which were happening in your day, when you, all the days when you were doing it. Um, a while ago, I did a lot of work into um, research into darning and the darning sacks, and they were very much about women learning a skill to get employment by it. But the, and one nice thing is that they went on to do their downing samples after their floral sampler. After they acquired skills with their floral, they went on to downing. And I always thought that was a very nice way of <laughs> arranging the sequence. <laughs> Thank you, Lizia. And I've got a little bit of darning on here. I actually had Kay Lawrence teach me how to darn. So I recorded that there. <laughs> well, lots of images of darning samples if you'd like them. I Thank you. Oh, I just wanted to say, Sarah, how lovely, wonderful it is. I really love it. Um, and it reminds me of, do you know, Tilika Schwartz's work? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, really, I was going to say that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's really fabulous. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Terrific work, Sarah. <laughs> and uh, there's a link to the other work that we've featured on Garland magazine as well, which is really important to work in terms of a settler experience. I think the layers that textile mm. can build up. Yeah. the work you had at Ararat. Uh, so Sharon, uh, we're going into the garden like so many other people at this uh, time in history. Um, let's have a look at your beautiful work and if you could tell us about it, thanks. Sharon, are you still with us? Uh, it seems like uh, Sharon might have dropped off uh, for some reason, but uh, one of the interests in Sharon's work is as a practice obviously related to embroidery uh, is, and using a dissolving thread in her work is um, the way in which it blurs the relationship between uh, people and nature or people and the world around them, which has been kind of an interesting feature of Australian textile fibre art, which is uh, sort of dissolving the subject object binary that uh, is uh, so much about our preconceptions of the world and uh, so this kind of absorption in the garden is very much revealed in this particular work so uh, I'm really pleased that it can be here. All right so let's move on now Sharon, to... That? Sorry? Sharon's just come back off mute. Uh, Sharon, hello? No. No. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm. Okay. Um, the work will speak for her in this case. Uh, so next, perhaps uh, Shukle, maybe Sarah, you could again speak or we can hear yeah. from Shukle. Hello, Shukle. 
Hello, Shukla. Yes. Hear me? Yes. Hello, Shukla. Hello, Shukla. Yes. Hear me? Yes. Shukla, do you want to speak about your work or do you have your son who can speak? Uh, my son, my daughter, no teacher. No, okay. Do you want to say please. something? No, thank you, teacher, please. Uh, me? Hear me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you so much, teacher. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, look, there's probably not a whole lot more to say, and I know I've, I've, I've talked probably far too much, but probably something I'd just like to say about um, both of them is just the lovely way that they've picked up the technique and then just uh, um, found their own way of going about it. So, um, for instance, Munor weaves from the, the back, um, which is in fact what happens in, in France and many workshops and um, I think that's just how she works when she weaves cloths and it seems to work beautifully for her and Shukle um, moves from working with flat tapestry which you see in this um, floating leaves uh, piece to the, the previous piece, uh, piece, Springtime, where she often uses a, a slightly different technique, which is a, a sumac. So it's a sort of a kind of slow knotting technique. And sometimes I think she does that when often you take the, um, <coughs> the, the, la the tapestries with a lot of the sort of fluid laying in look perfectly square on the loom and then you take them off the loom and they kind of bounce into all sorts of crazy um, shapes. And the first one she did like that, was, she just was so upset. Um, but in fact, it's the most wonderful fluid tapestry which was bought by a young person who, who loved it. Um, so that's really kind of interesting with these two pieces in terms of, of technique. Um, but otherwise, I think when I asked her about them again, we sat down for a while with her daughter talking through different, um, yeah, different uh, possibilities for titles and she came up with springtime and falling leaves. So this is how um, Shukle works on a small wooden frame which we clamp to a, a, a chair, um, very much in, in her kitchen surrounded by family. She lives with eight, seven or eight other people, I think, nieces and daughter and grandson now. Uh, so it's a very busy household. <clears throat> so she works often at night when they've all gone to bed or in the summer she'll go out into the garden and work there where it's, it's quieter. Um, that's probably all of the, um, the image below is a detail of a tapestry, which um, one of the lovely links, there's so many gorgeous links in this, um, in this project, uh, links to um, Eloise Rapp, uh, who worked with uh, Shukle and um, Munor on, on a project uh, where her, their tapestries were translated by Eloise into textile designs for um, a company in in Sydney, and um, that was just a, be a, a just a, a really lovely project. Thank you very no, much, you uh, your... Sarah, yes. and thank you, Shukle. Yeah. Thank you. Beautiful thank work. You. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, DJ. <laughs> Beautiful work, Shukle. Love it. Thank you. <laughs> Love it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, haven't seen any rabbits yet, but maybe we'll have one coming up. Uh, Siri, uh, Siri Hayes, uh, Hi. are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Um, yeah. yeah, so uh, I'm not sure where to start, except that I work um, as an artist mainly in um, photography and uh, probably in the last 10 years or so textiles. So I've always made textiles since I was a young, young'un. And uh, it's come into my practice possibly because I've uh, started using natural dye or botanical dye or whatever you want to call it 
um, I saw the possibility of it being similar to a photograph in the way that it could record a trace of a place. And so I've become really interested in, in bringing in the, the botanical dye as a record of a, of a particular place in the way that a photograph can be as well. So with this project, uh, I was really excited to be able to uh, travel to Japan or Kanazawa in particular because I found this little uh, craft centre in the outskirts of Kanazawa where you could access an indigo dye vat, uh, a proper fermented one, um, which, are, you know, they're, they're quite an incredible thing to be able to set up. And I was really, um, I kind of liken it a little bit to analogue darkroom photography where you um, watch indigo, the colour change before your eye in the similar way that photographs come up in the developer in an analogue darkroom. Uh, so what I did with this project was I, I was kind of interested in hopefully being able to engage um, with Kanazawa as a complete foreigner, having no, not travelled there before, being there with my family and somehow having some kind of meaningful interaction with it. And my idea was to pre-dye yarn in Melbourne um, on a wondery country using the local red box which is uh everywhere all around me and it's something i've grown up with and, and is an incredibly familiar leaf and tree and so that's what the orangey red colors are and then um i took the same yarn with me and dyed in these indigo vats in kanazawa and then I wanted to weave it together. So it's kind of like weaving a, I don't know, a relationship between me and this new place that I, I wasn't familiar with. And then it came back to my photographic practice where I was traveling there with my family and this is my daughter. And I wanted to sort of show us, so I used it as a backdrop, the weaving, I called it Kanazawa cloth, um, to sort of, as a parent, a tourist and an artist in a new place, uh, sort of represent that experience. And so that's my daughter holding a ice cream and on it is the gold leaf, which is, um, if you've ever been to Kanazawa, generally any of the tourist spots you come across, there'll be ice creams with this gold leaf. And it's a nod to the local tradition, uh, not tradition, but the local specialist craft in gold leaf lacquer. And so I felt like as a coming in as a textiles person and is kind of really acknowledging that beautiful uh, craft that you encounter just about anywhere you go in Japan. Um, and, you know, just also that that ignited my children's uh, imagination as well. So it felt appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Siri. All leaf ice cream in front of this cloth. So that's essentially what the project was. And I'm uh, pretty excited that it well, it certainly uh, deserves a wide airing. And I know in Garland Magazine, it's been interesting, even though it's ostensibly a craft publication that uh, uh, photographers like you uh, play such a, a key role. And I think you must be a fairly unique person to have combined uh, <laughs> photography with weaving like that. And it certainly comes up with such wonderful results, which we hope to, to see in real life. Any comments for Siri? Just say it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. I, can't I love the photo, it's great. Yeah. And, and I think that um, this project is truly a great example of how textile can be an expanded field of inquiry because here the photography, although it's a main um, medium, but textile is the one that's actually binding um, the image together. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's yeah thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, next if we can go to Susie. Um, okay, so um, oh, it's you on. piece you're putting up. Yep. <laughs> uh, um, so the book that I've got is, it's called It's Not the Job, It's the Cabbage. Um, I was living in southern Nepal and I was doing lots of little embroidered portraits of the local people that I was working with because uh, it was all about icons because uh, I was seeing all these posters of gods. Um, and so a lot of my work is storytelling. And I used to work, I worked for 20 years as a theatrical tailor in 
London and Australia. Um, and so I started uh, interviewing different tailors in different places that I was working. I was working with the Handicraft Project in Tibet. So I, one of the pages is a big interview with uh, the tailors there. And I interviewed the Dalai Lama's tailor about um, his journey. Um, and so it was about telling the stories, but using the craft that unites them all. So it's stitched on tailoring canvas, the portraits are stitched and where possible I've used the fabrics. So for the Dalai Lama's tailor's story, I've used Tibetan applique techniques. So I've tried to use the techniques and the materials relevant to the different tailors. Um, and I've used Tibetan brocade. Then I interviewed tailors in London, in um, Savile Row, and theatrical tailors that I used to work with. So I used um, all tailoring stitches, you know, pad stitching and buttonhole and everything. Um, and uh, so, it, yeah, so it was about this uh, uniting everyone with the craft and with the technique um, and just telling their different stories. Um, and oh, and this title comes from one of the tailors that I was interviewing in London. He's an old East End tailor who then went into making for theatre after everyone stopped having suits made. Um, and he said, it's not the job, it's the cabbage, because the cabbage is the leftover fabric. So if a tailor can save enough fabric um, from a job, they call that the cabbage and it comes from a French word. Um, and so that's where that little uh, title came from. So yeah, so it's all on fabric and it's all stitched and some digital printing onto fabric, which I've then stitched into it as well. Oh, and this is, so as I said, I was doing all these uh, stitch portraits of people in Nepal and I've carried on doing the stitch portraits. This is a recent one I did of my mum. And I started off doing very dense little pictures and they've got sparser as the uh, more portraits that I've done. So, I've, you know, to allow the fabric to show through. Um, and I do these with fine machine embroidery thread. Mm. Um, and that's that. <laughs> mm. Any questions? It's interesting in, in Garland magazine how we've seen so many interesting new developments in embroidery, uh, particularly portraiture and embroidery, which you wouldn't normally associate. Perhaps it's going in the other direction to photography and textile theory of uh, <laughs> embroidery being uh, something which captures uh, the moment and uh, people around them. Any comments for Susie? I was just going to say, it's really sort of exquisitely done, the, the cabbage. I love the cabbage. <laughs> um, but um, regarding the portrait, it's very interesting because I've been looking at Sharon Peoples' um, portraits, which uh, has a great intensity of stitch. And, um, and this, and you know, by contrast, this with the sparse stitching. And yeah. And yeah. in in both, you know, you've, you've both captured people so beautifully. Mm. Yeah, it's a wonder of that kind of economy. So thank you very much, uh, Susie. Now, Valerie. Uh, hello, Valerie. I'll just get your work up. Yes. Hi, everyone. And just waiting for the pictures to come up. Uh, but the work, yes, here we are. Uh, the work in the show is a tapestry, uh, quite a large tapestry for an individual weaver. It's approximately a metre square, which for me as a weaver is a, a good project where you can really get into the depth of the weaving. And because a large tapestry is quite a commitment in terms of time and your actual work in producing the tapestry, I do quite a lot of research, drawing, development work before I start the tapestry. Uh, this piece of work came from visiting the Age of Fishes Museum in Canandra. I came across this museum 
and was really fascinated by the story of finding this very vast field of fossils, amazing fossils that um, gave people an enormous amount of physical material to use in research. In fact, there's a whole field there which is just great big lumps of fossil waiting to be looked at, categorized and examined. So when I was at the museum and I made repeat visits, I loved the history, the kind of sense of time, the diagrams showing you the scale going back in history. Uh, in the museum, large lumps of fossil, brown lumps of fossil fit. And of course, in a country museum, a wonderful diorama of what the fish actually looked like when they were alive and swimming in the ponds in the area. But when I came away from this and really distilled all of this information, the thing I realized was that it wasn't actually about uh, the fish themselves or trying to depict the fish. Uh, for me, the whole kind of inspiration was about our place in relation to time, in relation to this long distant past. As a child growing up in Scotland, I was very aware in my surroundings of ancient history. The Romans had marched through the area. On the field where I lived, you could see the marks of a marching fort. Uh, in the glen, a large mound uh, from prehistory with very little known about it, perhaps a burial mound, but not necessarily. And so in the land, I was used to having things around me that made me feel part of this continuum of time. So when I came to Australia, I found that I'm living in a culture where it's a very modern culture, lots of things are happening in the moment in time. And it was hard for me to have this sense of connection to ancient time. So finding the fossil collection has been a huge inspiration. Uh, last year, I also did research in Paris on plant fossils. And I find them actually very beautiful, drawing the forms. And when I get used to particular forms, I find that it creates a space in my imagination where I can play with the forms, not necessarily drawing them in that very detailed and graphic style that you often see within the museums, but in something that's creating that sense of space and ambiguity. Uh, so this piece, Floating Fossil, is really about that experience of time and place and a sense of imagining our space and time. Thank you very much, uh, Valerie. And the, the colours are quite sort of earthy, ochres and indigos. Oh yes, the colours. In, in did piece, you, how thinking, did you obtain them? Yes, they, I use commercial yarn, so I don't dye the colours myself. And in this piece, I was thinking about the fossils are found in the ground. They're brown when they're in the museum. But of course, the fossils once were fish swimming in ponds. And so the suggestion by the colour is of the earth, the water, and the space around. Good. Thank you very much. It's great to have, again, another epic work um, mm -hmm. in this particular it's exhibition exquisite. with such depth. Any other comments for Valerie? I just love the mystery of it, Valerie. I think it's, it captures the mystery of those yeah. fossils. I once held a 250 million year old fossil um, that an artist, fellow artist, um, gave me, and it's just the ama most amazing feeling. Yeah. It's, it's rich amazing. with history. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. At one time, oh. someone in Australia gave me an ammonite, and I just felt amazing to have something of that age and so perfectly formed and that yeah. had lasted that time. Thank you very much, uh, Valerie. And now we go to Picky Mason. Uh, whose work is unusual in being jewellery, but has got a very strong textile component to her work, as is obvious from that particular brooch. Um, Vicky, can you tell us about uh, this work? 
Um, yeah, sure. Uh, so this is um, red metal wattle flower. And um, a few years ago, I kind of have a research based practice. I was really interested in um, the fact that the New Zealand flax that I'd planted in my garden, my husband said, Oh, I want some plants from New Zealand. We're both Kiwis and we're migrants. Um, he wanted a plant that reminded him of home. And, and the, the flax plant got burnt one year, the tips of the, the fronds got burnt. And it really struck me that year that. I was living in a climate that's incredibly hot and that we have, you know, buying a house and learning to garden that, you know, I needed to be gardening for where I now lived. And so I thought, what a great opportunity to look into Australian plants. I'm mildly obsessed with plants in my practice. And so um, I thought I need to be learning about gardening sustainably, but looking at plants that are water tolerant, that um, can, once they're established, survive on you know rainfall alone and so that took me down a rabbit hole of of research which took me to Barcelona I had the Australia Council studio um, and spent time at the botanic gardens there they have the largest collection of Mediterranean plants in the world and and it was really amazing seeing these Australian plants in this international garden that was you know all about you know plants that are water tolerant that survive on very little rainfall, if at all. And so I came back and, and developed these works for um, a show that was called Dry. And these works are an extension of those works from 2017 onwards. Um, the wattles are based on the clay wattle, which is um, known as Acacia glautoptera, um, also known as flat wattle. And there are all these amazing plants that are really suitable for residential and domestic gardens that I kind of discovered. Um, and the eucalypts, so uh, they're the other plants with the kind of pointy, brooches with the pointy bits in them. They came out of um, looking at trees in Barcelona at the gardens. Um, and yeah, they're made with linen and they're knotted onto, it's just an overhand knot onto a metal frame that I make. Uh, they're incredibly labor intensive, um, but I love making them and I'm a real fan of color. So it allows me to kind of vent that love. Um, and yeah, make the brooch pins, they're powder coated. And I've actually went and just got a couple of pieces now because I thought it might be interesting for people to see the back of them. I don't know if that's going to register or not. Mm. Oh, they're lovely. But the backs are knotted. Yes. Um, yeah, so it gives you a sense of, mm. you know, what's going on at the back. And yeah, so I just, you know, they're all about sustainability of resources and kind of, you know, wanting to advocate for our need to learn how to garden for Australia and adapting our gardens to kind of suit our climate. You know, we're getting drier and drier, there's less precipitation. So they're, you know, they're very simple works, but within them, I think there's a lot of, there are lots of stories and layers, so yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Vicky. And it's a, there's a beautiful video of uh, you making uh, these pieces by Mark, Mark Newbound uh, in Garland and uh, as well as some other articles and it's just a, a wonder to to see them being stitched into that form so thank you and it's another strong eucalypt theme which seems to be uh -huh. quite characteristic through this uh, any other comments for vicky thanks for showing us the back of them yeah that really completes the picture it's mm. <laughs> <Here's our> eloise <laughs> okay lastly we have uh Yunwen Perez, uh, who unfortunately is in Mexico on an inconvenient uh, time zone at the moment, uh, but who's, while she's been in Melbourne, has uh, been uh, developing her weaving techniques, particularly to draw on some of her Indigenous Mexican heritage and particularly some of the key items in that. Previously, she's been looking at the Quetzalcoatl, the um, Mexican flying serpent, and uh, here she is looking at the colibri, the hummingbird, which is such, a, such an important figure in uh, those particular belief systems. And, uh, but we're very lucky to have uh, Yunwen uh, online for us uh, today 
in a recorded form to uh, share with us uh, her thoughts. Hopefully this will work. Let's um, see. Hello everyone, my name is Junwen. Can you hear and her? And I want to say hello to you uh, virtually um, at this opening of the exhibition Make World Again. Under these extreme and extraordinary circumstances we are living in, um, and that is shifting the way we live in this world and we make art and craft and design. Uh, so having this virtual exhibition, it's definitely um, a challenge for all of us, but I want to thank Kevin Murray for pushing forward and for his advocacy to support artists and our work, no matter our level, um, emerging mid career or established artist. I know in Kevin there is a an ally uh, to support our work. So thank you for your advocacy. Thank you for your support and commitment to all our practice, um, to our endeavors. And I wish you all well. And I know Australia is going through really. Um, a better place, I guess, than many other places in the world. I'm currently in Mexico, um, confined. Um, that's a very long story, but hopefully I'll see you soon. I'll meet you soon in person, and hopefully we will gather together to celebrate our work and to celebrate our world. Mm. Mm. Lovely message. Yeah, yeah. that's beautiful. Yeah. Can you unmute Kevin? Oh, Kevin. Sorry, this uh, <laughs> brings things to a formal close and I, we can continue, but I'd just like to uh, thank you so much for the work that you've given to this exhibition. And uh, it really feels as though it's where it, if it would have been in Canada, it would have been completed and done and dusted. It feels like now it's really the beginning of perhaps a longer series, uh, which will include exhibitions, but uh, a lot of dialogues and uh, hopefully uh, raise people's awareness of the kind of work being done in Australia and the very productive work in terms of uh, bringing a, a nation together in, in, a, in a way which is through a dialogue rather than a single voice and through the, the medium of a craft that's brought such an understanding of nature and the world around us as well as the traditions that we've inherited. So I just wanted to thank you very much uh, and 